Okay, welcome back class to another recorded lecture for Introduction to Material Science and Engineering. In this lecture we're going to be addressing material processing. Obviously from the slide in front of you we're starting with metals but we will include processing methods for metals, ceramics, and polymers. If you've listened to the lecture or read the lecture notes for, for composite materials, uh, you've already heard a little bit about processing of composites and some of the methods that are specific to thermoset uh, polymers such as reaction injection molding, pultrusion, and uh, filament winding, and techniques like that. This will concentrate, today's lecture will concentrate more on monolithic materials, so uh, that's everything other than composites, but we'll definitely include things that are multi-phase, although we won't specifically be addressing microstructure uh, other than where it's particularly relevant to the processing. So we're going to start with metals and we're going to work our way into ceramics, three different types of ceramic processing, and then polymer synthesis and a couple of methods by which thermoplastics in particular are processed since we covered uh, some of the methods for thermoset processing with composites. And we'll finish up with a couple of unique methods for thermoplastic processing. So. Getting into metals, uh, metals fabrication uh, basically includes uh, four different methods. Casting, mechanical forming, which can be done either hot or cold, and in this case hot meaning above about half of the melting point such that we get dynamic recrystallization and recovery. If you remember from strengthening and defects, that's the temperature at which we get very rapid dislocation climb and we can annihilate dislocations so we're not getting an increasing progressive cold working during our forming. So hot work uh, is above dislocation climb temperature and again about half the melting point. Electroforming is a little bit unique and it serves in cases where other methods fail, uh, especially when we have to make uh, retro curved axis symmetric parts that couldn't easily be cast or definitely couldn't be formed. We'll discuss that a little bit. But do require of course that we have a, a conductive workpiece, which is not a problem with metals. And then uh, powder processing, that's a, a mainline ceramic processing method that can be applied to metals and is particularly useful for, uh, for refractory metals. So starting at the top, casting, if you're not familiar with what it is, it's where you melt a material. Uh, in this case, we're discussing metals, but this would apply definitely to polymers. And you cast it into a near net shape mold. Uh, that means that the mold is more or less the shape of your finished product. Uh, in primary metals, where you're talking about uh, refining from ore, quite often metals are cast into what used to be called a billet. That's uh, Billet casting has been in large part replaced by continuous casting, especially uh, for electric arc uh, furnace processing. But uh, back in the day and in, and in some applications, uh, casting is done initially into a billet, which is then uh, processed further by rolling or, or other hot forming methods. When we talk about casting for a manufacturing process, uh, we're talking about casting pretty much into the shape that we're going to use, with final shaping mainly being done by a subtractive manufacturing method like machining. So when we have uh, direct casting of our part, the as-cast finished properties of the material are going to be highly dependent on cooling rate because the higher cooling rate gives us smaller grains, which of course is one method of strengthening. Mechanical forming, we use mechanical force to induce plastic deformation and get the material to literally flow plastically into the shape we want. Uh, those types of techniques would include things like uh, extrusion, wire drawing, rolling, as well as near net shape forming into a mold, open or closed die molding. And again, this can be done hot, if we need to, uh, if we need to have large reductions in a single pass, or if we need to fill a very intricate mold and hold tight tolerances, hot forming will allow us to do that better without the risk of cracking. But cold forming, uh, which is again processing below recrystallization temperature, allows us to achieve strengthening and forming at the same time. So obviously that has some benefits. With electroforming, we literally cathodically deposit a metal from a solution of its cations, and that can be either an aqueous solution, which uh, is, is probably 
uh, most familiar to folks who have done some electroplating. But we can also deposit from molten salts, which are an excellent electrolyte, and allow us to work with a lot of materials that otherwise uh, couldn't be easily put into solution in an aqueous solution. And one of those you might be familiar with is aluminum, of course, which requires a molten salt electrolyte for primary refining. Um, some of the refractory metals and some of the platinum group metals are also very, very amenable to electroforming from a molten salt solution. So like most electroform materials and some cast materials, the microstructure is going to be a function of our deposition rate, which unlike casting is a function of current as well as the, uh, the composition of the material. So one nice thing about electroforming is we have a lot of options for changing microstructure that we don't have in some of our other processing methods. And last but not least, powder processing. Again, we will, we will address this twice in this lecture, but basically it involves sintering or forming a continuous material from a fine powder by using the surface energy uh, of the small powder particles uh, as a driver for consolidation and elimination of void space. And we help that along a little bit by applying some pressure, either uniaxial or multi-axis, and then using heat uh, to, uh, to facilitate the reaction. We're basically, again, as is the case with dislocation, annihilation, or recrystallization, we're allowing creep mechanisms, vacancy diffusion, uh, to move those grains and rearrange the void spaces to eliminate the surfaces and end up with a, a void-free uh, finished product or close to void-free. Okay, we're going to start with casting and with probably one of the oldest forms of casting. It's called sand casting and it, it's quite what it says. Uh, you use sand, a, a silica sand quite often, with a, some kind of polymer binder as a mold. And uh, the molds for these can be very intricate, and they include uh, gates and risers uh, that allow the mold to be filled and to provide some hydrostatic back pressure of molten metal to account for solidification shrinkage. Uh, this is very amenable for large parts, especially ones that are made from things like cast iron that can be molded, uh, that are very fluid in the molten state, can fill a mold well. And uh, again, good for large parts and ones that are one-offs, where you're only going to make one because these are, are made in one go. Uh, patterns are maintained, but the actual mold is made and then destroyed uh, on removal of the workpiece. So again, pump housings, uh, some larger engine parts, some um, civil structures, uh, generally things that are large that can tolerate a low solidification rate. Uh, so these, these tend to have slow cooling rates because sand is a good insulator. So we don't, we don't usually end up achieving a very refined microstructure. So things that can tolerate large grains, don't have huge fracture toughness requirements, are very amenable to this technique. So going kind of to the other end, if we need to make parts faster, or if we need to achieve a higher solidification rate, a higher cooling rate, get a more refined microstructure right off the bat, uh, or we need to achieve closer to our near net shape. We don't need as much post casting machining. We would go to a, a die casting or a permanent mold casting where the molten metal is forced into a closed mold under pressure. So obviously for this we need, uh, the molds are going to be much more expensive, but they can be reused sometimes at a high rate for high rate manufacturing. We're going to need a much more fluid molten metal. So typically this is more amenable to lower melting point metals. Sand casting you can use for steels, uh, the higher temperature cast irons. Uh, dye and permanent mold casting tends to be used more for, uh, for non-ferrous materials, aluminum, zinc, uh, things with a lower melting point, but with the proper molding materials, especially a ceramic for instance, uh, you can use the higher temperature metals. But makes the process more expensive. So we can get higher rates, we can get faster cooling temperature or faster cooling rates, so we can get something that's going to have uh, a refined microstructure, smaller grains, maybe a directional solidification if we need that to get some anisotropic properties, 
um, and our, our surfaces are going to be much closer to what we need for a finished part. And in fact, sometimes you won't need to do any post-cast machining in these cases. Okay, stepping back in our, on our manufacturing process for metals, I had mentioned that casting uh, that we're discussing in this case, both the sand and the, the permanent mold die casting, are for making finished parts. Uh, and that billet casting was maybe the old-fashioned way of going from our, our, uh, our ore refining and initial achievement of molten metal to the follow-on processes for making what we call mill products, rolled sheets and, and other, other types of continuous products. What has replaced billet casting now is what's called continuous casting. And you can see a picture of it here. Uh, in this case, the original formation of the molten metal uh, I, usually from its reduction from ore, so in the case of steel from the blast furnace, it's tapped uh, in its molten state and it is continuously cast into something that uh, is obviously you can see is, is more or less axisymmetric. It's a long, long mill product is what it's called. And it can go into something uh, that would be closer to its net shape. So these these cast products that you're seeing coming out of the bottom end of the furnace um, will probably be processed continuously in an integrated mill into reinforcement bar or beams or uh, plate or even go on into uh, feeding a cold forming line to make sheet or wire. So it's sort of a, a long continuous process. This gives us a much better microstructure and typically one that's more aligned in the direction that we care about. So uh, a cast billet usually requires a, a tremendous amount of forming to get rid of the original cast structure, which is very undesirable. Uh, it also tends to, to be susceptible to impurities. So this continuous casting here is, is definitely the more commonly used method to go right from our, our primary hot metal into follow on. Uh, formed structures. Speaking of which, continuous cold forming. So our continuous casting would feed probably a hot forming line which would reduce those those cross-sectional uh, cast bars that you are seeing coming out of the furnace uh, down to maybe a preliminary plate shape or a, some kind of reduced cross-section that could then feed a cold forming line. And what you're seeing on this slide is an example of that where we have a plate coming in from the upper right and it's being rolled to a, a smaller cross section, a thinner gauge. And then it's going through a set of forming and patterning rolls and coming out as what looks like possibly a structural beam or some kind of uh, roofing material or a gutter. And so each, each roller uh, either achieves a reduction in gauge, making it thinner, and also forms. So it's one continuous process where we're plastically deforming the metal in this case, aligning grains. We're imparting some strength because this is all being done below recrystallization temperature. So it's getting stronger every time it goes under one of those rollers. So we're working above yield and below recrystallization and also achieving the shape we want. This is a very, uh, a very efficient way of forming a product. We're strengthening and shaping at the same time. Near net shape hot forming. Uh, there are cases where you cannot achieve the reductions that you need to form your part without intermediate recrystallization and uh, going through intermediate annealing and forming cold working steps is time consuming. It can be very expensive energetically. So in many cases, it's much cheaper and more efficient from an energy standpoint to simply do all of your forming above recrystallization. And you can do this on a continuous line, uh, rolling and, and extruding. Uh, you can also use it to make near net shape parts, which is what you're seeing here. So the part that will come out of this might require a little bit of machining or possibly some, some surface treatment. Um, grit blasting or what have you to remove scale, uh, but then might, might be ready to go into service immediately thereafter. So this can form a complete part in one or two forming steps, all working above recrystallization temperature. So obviously we're not going to get any cold working out of this process, but we might be able to, for instance, uh, if this were a steel, 
it might come out of one of these hot forming processes and we could quench it, form some martensite, do a temper, and have a very strong near net shape part uh, that requires only a tiny bit of machining. So this is a, a very important technique in the, the metals manufacturing repertoire to be able to do uh, large reductions and significant amounts of forming above recrystallization, very few steps, and then uh, either leverage that high temperature state for heat treatment immediately um, or cool to room temperature with a normalizing treatment and still have very little to do thereafter. Electroforming. So this is where we reduce uh, a metal from ions and molten salt or aqueous solution and this cross-section is an example of uh, an electroformed copper part on a mandrel. And you can see that what we're doing is we're forming an axisymmetric part. Uh, this is a cross-section. You can imagine it being revolved around its, its central axis. The mandrel quite often is something that can be burned away. It's uh, a conductive carbon is, is the most typically used one and you can get a hollow, very complex shape that otherwise would be nearly impossible to, to achieve with casting or forming or powder processing. So these, uh, these convex and concave uh, axisymmetric tubular shapes are very frequently electroformed. And the example at the top, the rhenium inserts for rocket nozzle throats are particularly useful because they can be formed on the inside of a uh, of a graphite backing which then can be put into service by itself as the backer uh, in the rocket being conductive in high temperature and you're able to form the rhenium uh, insert directly on top of it and really there is no other way of forming that for that particular application so it's an example of an of an arena where electroforming is is achieving something unique that couldn't be done any other way in terms of cost and, and production rate, uh, there's many times when electroforming is a great option, especially for thin, intricate parts. Uh, it can, it's, it's good for alloys as well as single composition materials. And again, the same type of grain refining and alloy segregation that can be achieved with casting or forming or follow-on heat treatment can quite frequently be achieved by just varying your current and your potential uh, and the conditions of your deposition and solution. So there's um, a lot of possibility uh, for shaping and strengthening and achieving some unique structures with electroforming. Okay, what happens when you can't make it out of a single piece? So metals joining. And a lot of these methods are common, uh, not so much to ceramics, but you'll see a few of them in polymers. So we have three options in the metals world for joining things. So the starting from low temperature to high temperature and going in order of an increasing amount of interaction between the filler metal or the two parent substrates. So low temperature, minimal interaction, soldering. So it tends to be a low strength joint quite often intended for either thermal or electrical conductivity. I'm sure. A lot of folks are familiar with soldering for electrical circuits. You have minimal integration of the base and the filler metal. They, they basically don't interdiffuse to any great extent. There's certainly no metallurgical joint. Uh, so the strength of a solder joint typically comes from a mechanical interlock. And then the solder uh, just maintains continuity again, typically for electrical resistance reduction. If we go one step up, get a little bit hotter, we allow a little bit of interdiffusion of the base and the filler metal. We're in the realm of brazing. Uh, this is good for just about anything you'd use for soldering that can take the heat where the substrate wouldn't be compromised by the greater amount of heat necessary. And in brazing, we will get enough integration of base and filler or of two substrates to achieve some mechanical strength. It's rare that you can braze without a filler metal. Uh, you, you will require a full welding process to, to go filler metal free, uh, but the high temperature end of brazing uh, will involve a tremendous integration between your filler metal and your substrate. So with welding, we're at our highest temperatures, 
uh, we have the highest strength joints and we have a complete metallurgical bond. So you can think of that as being like a miniature casting uh, that is limited to the surfaces of your, your two work pieces that you're joining. You can do welding with or without a filler metal. Um, most welding techniques uh, involve a filler metal, but several of them, such as tungsten inert gas and some of the electrical resistance and laser welding, don't necessarily have to have them. Uh, in all cases, a welding process will provide you with strength that is equal to or greater than the pre-weld base metal. This is if it's done properly. Obviously, if it's not, uh, you might have no strength at all. An important thing to remember because you are working at high temperatures and you are effectively getting a small casting is all of the heat effects that you saw in heat treatment, uh, martensitic transformations and grain growth and precipitates, uh, those can all be driven by the heat input of the weld and that will be a problem in the adjacent metal and so uh, that will often be referred to as the heat affected zone in the adjacent material next to the weld and uh, removing those heat effects is an important part of the welding process. Quite often after a welding uh, operation on a heat treatable steel the entire part will have to be reheat treated in order to remove the untempered martensite that has just formed adjacent to the weld. That very brittle material needs to be at the very least tempered uh, so that we don't uh, have a very embrittled part. So welding processes can get expensive for that reason, especially on large parts that involve martensitic transformations. Okay, moving on to ceramics. We're going to address three main ceramic fabrication methods. One is glass forming, and so this is pretty much exclusive to silicate glasses. These are amorphous materials for the most part. Uh, the definition of glass being an amorphous, typically a silicate. So you can basically lower the temperature and uh, look at all of these silicate glass forming methods as having analogs over in the amorphous polymers world. So your atactic polystyrenes and things like that, many of them will be amenable to these same kind of processes. We'll discuss particulate forming which will have commonalities with powder metallurgy techniques. So this is where we will, in all cases, use a drive for surface energy reduction to consolidate parts from powders, uh, either with use of a flux or just the surface energy uh, reduction drive. And we'll address both how to uh, shape something from the green state, where we're using usually an organic or a water-based binder uh, to shape the powder in a, in a clay paste or liquid slip form and then the sintering process by which that greenware uh, is is consolidated and forms a, a monolithic part. Cementation for the purpose of this discussion is Portland cement and that is actually formation of a an inorganic network polymer from a calcium silicate. And we'll just have one slide on that, but that is so important as, uh, as the main mechanism for concrete, uh, which is used uh, ubiquitously in the civil engineering world. We want to at least cover how that fits into the ceramic fabrication method uh, realm and what it has in common with network polymers. So starting with glass forming, um, we can form glass in much the same way we did some of the, uh, the very high viscosity um, thermosets where we have uh, a fairly high viscosity, they call it a gob, that is actually a term in the glass making world. So this would be a, a high viscosity workpiece that's still flexible. This is of course amorphous silicate. It is it's dispensed into a mold and then and then formed in the mold uh, an open die process very similar to a lot of the hot work metals uh, forming you know, the material will flow up around the upper part of the mold and form what's usually a complete net shape part obviously glass uh, is not amenable to post-processing machining so uh, most of the processes for glass are single pass uh, part formation uh, we can use compressed air and uh, a bladder or a second workpiece to make a more intricate uh, finish on the interior. So again, this, this would be common to, to polymers and even some metal uh, parts formed in enclosed eye processes. 
So generally pressing is used for cheaper parts. Um, typically we'll have graphite, which is a, an energy, has a surface energy that's fairly amenable to working with glass and is also conductive. So we can tailor our cooling rate uh, so that we can have a high throughput but not have to worry about a, a fracture toughness issue. And last but not least is fiber drawing. Uh, very important for producing the, the raw materials for our, our reinforcement for composites, definitely. And so this obviously is done with a much, uh, a much lower viscosity uh, glass than the other two. Uh, obviously there's there's no melting point this is an amorphous material so what we're working with in terms of our work pieces being a semi-solid versus a liquid is is merely a reduction in viscosity by increasing temperature or by disrupting the silicate networks sheet glass forming this is called float glass because one of the ways of making a nice even surface uh, continuous surface with no defects is to use another liquid. So in this technique we heat the glass up in a primary melting furnace, get it to the temperature and the viscosity that we want, and we dispense it in the liquid form uh, into a slightly cooler furnace. It's, the temperature is maintained uh, usually with combustion on top or potentially with a resistance furnace, excuse me, resistor element. But the glass is, is literally floated on top of liquid tin and it will stay on the top because of surface tension differences and density differences. And this allows it to cool slowly uh, to a low enough viscosity that it will hold shape as it exits the furnace and maintain the surface finish we want for mirrors or uh, other types of architectural glass. So we've discussed a lot about viscosity of silicate glasses in the melt and how we will use a high viscosity as a work piece for say a, a pressing operation but we'll need something much more fluid, much lower viscosity for say fiber drying. Well obviously one of the ways that we can lower viscosity of a melt is to raise the temperature. But another way that we can do it is to actually lower the melt viscosity at a given temperature chemically by disrupting in this case the, the silica tetrahedron network of glass. So looking way back to our bonding section back in uh, what was chapter two, if you're using fourth or fifth edition of the Callister text, uh, silicates are a silica uh, four plus ion surrounded by oxygen ions. And those are hooked together. All those tetrahedra are hooked together to make a network. If we introduce some monovalent or divalent ions like sodium or calcium or tetravalent like aluminum or boron, we create a charge imbalance. And so we have to introduce some vacancies into that network. This is very similar to what we saw with um, ionic bonding in a crystal where if we replace, say, a cation with a, a tetravalent ion, uh, we had to have a, a cation vacancy somewhere adjacent to it to maintain charge balance. Because we have a, a network polymer, like a covalently bonded structure here, we don't have to be thinking about this in terms of adjacent interstitials, but we do have to maintain charge balance. So in this case, we maintain that charge balance by breaking some of the tetrahedral bonds uh, adjacent to these extra cations. And because we, we already don't have a crystal structure, and now we are, we're effectively opening up that 3D covalent network we're able to get a, a tremendous reduction in viscosity in the melt. And so uh, these are called uh, soda glasses or Pyrex modified glasses. Uh, basically these cation additions allow our silica glasses to be processable in the melt. Uh, without that it would be very very difficult to process and in fact pure silica uh, glasses are somewhat rare and expensive. So generally the higher the valency of the cation that's used for the processing the more of the uh, of the original fused silica properties that we retain uh, the, the soda lime glasses that use alkali metals tend to have the the greatest network disruption uh, effect on the glass so we get a good viscosity reduction and make it easy to process but they tend to be the weakest of our glasses and have the lowest uh, thermal strength so since glasses, silicate glasses are, are pretty much exclusively uh, amorphous and are 
don't have a melt temperature, they're not crystalline materials, it, it's a nice time to take a look and do a quick review of important thermal properties and benchmarks for amorphous materials. So we touched on this possibly in our viscoelastic properties and in our polymer structures, but this is a great review if we already have, and if we haven't, this is, uh, this is an important point to make about amorphous materials. So if we look at the specific volume, um, so that's like a molar volume of a material versus temperature, and we have a crystalline material, so a uh, typical metal or maybe something like polyethylene or uh, a quartz uh, silicate, it's going to form a crystal. As we reduce the temperature of the liquid, it's very disordered, so it has a very high specific volume or low density, you can think of that. It'll reach a point where it will start to crystallize, and it'll go from a disordered liquid structure to a very ordered solid in our nice crystal unit cells. Throughout that time, we're going to hit a thermal arrest. So as we take heat, out of that liquid melt, the temperature is not going to continue to drop. All of the heat uh, withdrawal from that material is basically going to go into crystallization. So uh, this is very basic thermodynamic first order transition uh, description here. But basically we're going to drop specific volume isothermally as we crystallize from the liquid into our, into our crystalline solid. Uh, amorphous materials don't do that. If we cool them down, they don't crystallize because they're amorphous. <laughs> By definition, they don't. They just continue to get more and more viscous. But they will encounter a point where the slope of that specific volume reduction versus temperature will take an abrupt bend. And hearkening back to our chapter on viscoelasticity, uh, this will be associated with tremendous change in properties. As we drop below that slope change temperature, we'll go from being rubbery or fluid to being very rigid. This is the glass transition temperature. Because it doesn't involve a drop in uh, specific volume, which is in this case is a thermodynamic property, a state variable, but just a slope change, it's called a second order change. So onset of glass transition temperature is the benchmark for both in-surface properties and in processing of our amorphous materials. So if you think about processing a glass, you definitely want to remain well above glass transition temperature because of the reduction in, in fracture toughness that we would have below that. And of course, in the case of silicate glasses, that means fairly high temperature processing. But the same would be true if we were processing any kind of amorphous polymer, even though the absolute processing temperature would be lower. Okay, when we're talking about processing a viscous solid, um, something that's important, we've bandied the term about viscosity, how thick the resistance to flow. Here's the actual technical definition. And for anyone who's heading into materials processing or, or mechanical engineering where you're going to deal with fluids, this is a, a very typical engineering term you'll encounter. And it is literally the ratio of shear stress, tau, which we saw with shear modulus and elasticity, so basically the force per unit area parallel to the surface that you're deforming, uh, versus velocity gradient and that's the gradient perpendicular to the surface to which the shear is being applied. So it's how fast the fluid is moving uh, at different distances from a surface versus the, uh, the force, the shear force stress, you know, shear force per unit area that's being applied. So shear stress versus velocity gradient, which is sometimes described as shear rate. Uh, that's not an acceleration, so that's um, that's a change in velocity with distance, so it's a, a spatial rate, and it has units of Pascal seconds. So viscosity, fluid viscosity, is, a, is very important for processing of anything in the melt, and certainly any kind of amorphous material that's going to be processed all the way down to glass transition temperature. So we discussed a little bit about the, uh, the function of network modifiers on our silicate glasses and how as we disrupt that 
uh, that silica tetrahedral network, we reduce our melt viscosity. We can look at some data for that for different types of commercial glasses, starting with probably the lowest viscosity versus temperature and unfortunately lowest properties. That's the soda lime silica glasses. It's shown in, in a green plot here on our viscosity versus temperature uh, plot. If we look at some alternative network modifiers that do not disrupt the network quite as, as much, you can see we have Pyrex. So for any given temperature, like uh, the 1000 degrees C there, you can see that our soda lime silicate glass will have a melt viscosity somewhere in the range of probably call it uh, 1000 pascal seconds, whereas your, your Pyrex will be up at closer to 10 to the 4th pascal seconds, so almost an order of magnitude difference. Almost a pure silicate uh, glass, Vicor, which um, is often used in an etched uh, condition for a porous glass, but just even if it's monolithic with no porosity, it's one of it's it's very close to being a pure silicate. So that uh, that boron oxide is the only network disruptor, our only network modifier. And you can see at a thousand degrees C, uh, we are at almost 10 to the 12th Pascal seconds. So if you were trying to form this with a, a pressing operation, you would need quite a bit more force. And you would also be getting, uh, getting close to the point where you might have to worry about residual stresses. So very, very difficult to process in the melt. So our network modifiers are very important for melt viscosity alteration and glass processing by several orders of magnitude there. And of course fused silica uh, goes by the term for a reason, um, shown in the purple there. It is now at the point where it is so difficult to process in the melt it's usually processed uh, with what's effectively a powder technique similar to a refractory ceramic, a crystalline refractory ceramic. So again, those are those are somewhat rare, rather expensive, uh, but of course uh, they don't have network modifiers and they will give some of the, the highest degrees of fracture toughness and strength of all of our amorphous uh, silicate materials. Okay, speaking of residual stresses, uh, even though uh, even though glass is processed hot, it doesn't have uh, a dislocation annihilation mechanism uh, to relieve its residual stresses quite the way that metals do. So uh, quite often you'll need to do a stress relief anneal just to remove stresses that are locked into the material by differences in, in cooling rates and the coefficient of thermal expansion differences. So. Uh, that's important to do for glass processing more again for uh, thermally induced stresses than say the volumetric uh, change of a phase transformation that you would get in metals. Uh, we can selectively apply thermal stresses and lock in residual thermal stresses in glass in order to give it some nice in-service properties and that is uh, known as tempering in the case of tempered glass for automotive uses and some types of safety glass uses in residential applications. So the aim of tempered glass is to put the surface in compression and as we know glass it's still a ceramic, it has very low fracture toughness compared to say a metal or most polymers, so it works best in compression where any kind of cracks that we have are stopped and don't have a, a tensile stress, a crack on opening stress that can drive them. So the aim of tempered glass is to create a compressive surface layer that can prevent surface scratches and defects from propagating through the material. And we use residual um, thermal stresses and differences in coefficient of thermal expansion to do that as a processing method. So we'll kind of step through that here. So we have a red hot piece of glass before cooling. It's a glass block or say a sheet that we're going to make a, a car windshield out of. So we're going to do some initial cooling on the surface and of course heat is going to leave the part on the surface and so we're going to end up with a cooler layer right on the surface and we're going to continue to cool it at that rate through those surfaces so their viscosity increases and they will as they start to shrink they won't be able to rearrange 
uh, to relieve those stresses and we will end up with a residual state of compression on the surface that's been locked in by the material getting to a higher viscosity on the surface so it can't flow and rearrange. The downside to this is we can't have anything accelerating. It's still in static equilibrium. So if we have net compressive stresses in the surface, unfortunately what that means is you got net tensile stresses on the interior. So if you ever do get a crack that makes it through those compressive layers for any reason, it, it tends to, to fail very quickly. And it's one of the reasons that uh, tempered glass goes from just having a small scratch to suddenly apparently spontaneously uh, uh, decomposing in, the, in a huge network of cracks, and it's because a crack has reached that tensile layer where, as we, as we remember from our fracture studies, uh, can then propagate very quickly and spontaneously. But that typically results in a crack network that, um, that doesn't create large shards. So even when tempered glass breaks, um, that compressive layer, which drives the cracks, drives it in a lot of directions at once and makes for some small pieces that can't, uh, you know, uh, pierce a human body, for instance, in the case of an automotive accident. So the last schematic there on the bottom just shows the, uh, the result of a com net compressive stress on a, a scratch or a crack that would otherwise be trying to propagate through the material. So this is, by the way, very akin to the reason that we shot peen uh, to preclude fatigue. Just the idea of we, if we put surfaces in compression, then the place that's most likely to have the most scratches and defects and cracks is in a state of net compression. So none of those can propagate easily. And of course, in the case of glass, which has a low fracture toughness, that's really important. Okay, on to particulate forming. So we're leaving the world of amorphous silicates and we're going into the world of crystalline ceramics, which includes most ceramic materials. So we're going to pick up all of our refractory oxide ceramics that are so important for, for our hard, high temperature applications, our aluminas and aluminosilicates, some of our, our clay minerals, uh, that are used in a fused state, and, and most of our very high-performance ceramics are processed this way. So most of these processes fall under what is called hydroplastic forming, and what that means is we're processing a very, very fine powder of our ceramic particles that are in either a water-based or an oil-based binder, such that we have a viscous paste again. So it's back to the same kind of ideas that we had for glass forming or for a lot of, of thermoplastic forming, except in this case what we're going to form is a green, uncentered uh, ceramic material that has uh, the powder, oxides, or carbides, and a binder that we will then have to center and form our, our real material. But uh, we're, using, we're using this hydroplastic state to get it into shape using, this is basically a, a form of powder processing. So the most common one, if we're going to form an axisymmetric part, is to load up our fine powder binder paste uh, into a die and extrude. And we can get just about any shape that we want. And of course this could be done with a thermoplastic as well. And again, this forms a greenware extrusion that would then have to be dried and fired. And firing in this term is an old, old industry standard in the ceramics world to indicate sintering, either liquid phase or solid phase, which forms our, our continuous part. If we have a very low viscosity uh, particle binder mix that's a fluid, we can use a, a, a process called slip casting where we would pour that fluid into a porous mold that removes some of the fluid by absor from, from the workpiece, uh, the filled mold by absorbing it, and then we'll get a very low, uh, low fluid layer of rind around the inside of the mold, and then we dump the excess fluid out and, uh, by draining the mold, and then we can fire it in situ or take it apart and fire it as a freestanding uh, greenware. So that is, is almost a reverse um, uh, kind of capillary uh, method of, of forming a part by using an absorptive mold. And again, what we're doing is just depositing a, a thick layer of our particle oxide ceramic with a little bit of binder uh, 
in a shape that we want. And this is excellent for achieving very, very intricate shapes um, from any kind of ceramic material. Uh, it's used quite a bit for, for artistic applications in, in the fine arts, but it's also used for intricate parts with, with technical ceramics. So many applications. Tape casting. This is used for everything from circuit boards to uh, battery cathodes and anodes, uh, any kind of part that is thin uh, and can be used to make multi-layer parts as well. So in this case we use the same sort of uh, slip. Uh, multiple viscosities uh, are achievable with our binder and our, and our ceramic particles in a slurry basically and then we use a thin blade to to basically meter out the amount that's being placed on a continuously rolling belt and we uh, dry off some of the fluid so that we form a continuous uh, soft plastic layer that does not self-adhere and can roll it up in the take-up reel so this is a, a continuous forming process again the material on the take-up reel uh, will not have finished properties in, unless it's fired. Although in some cases uh, it's used, could be used in the green state depending on what you're doing. If you're making a battery cathode you might very well use it in the green state. If however you need to have um, fired properties you're going to need to go from having just uh, particles of a, of a hard oxide ceramic say or a carbide ceramic uh, held together with a binder which is in, in that case is effectively a polymer matrix composite you might want to have complete oxide or carbide uh, network covalent bonding through the structure to get a full ceramic uh, properties you so you're going to to go from having your polymer binder as the continuous phase to having the ceramic itself as the continuous phase. And that is achieved through what was called sintering or firing. And so what we'll do in that case is take our wet green body uh, that came out of any one of these hydroplastic forming processes. We will continue to dry it even more uh, such that all of the residual water leaves. But as it leaves, the surface tension of that binder fluid will pull everything together and start eliminating some of the void space which we're going to want to do later on during full firing and sintering. Then we will put it into a furnace or an oven and we'll start to drive a decrease of surface energy and decrease of surface area and literally start to eradicate that void space and form a continuous ceramic phase. Uh, in some cases we achieve that by introducing a lower melting ceramic so that will literally form a liquid ceramic fluid. Sometimes that's an amorphous ceramic, more like a glass that will encapsulate our, our higher temperature crystalline ceramics. And in other cases, we will actually start, um, start connecting uh, and fusing through the sintering process our, our high temperature phases. So the, the photomicrograph that you can see down in the bottom right of this slide is actually a liquid phase sintering or vitrification where we've got um, some glass surrounding higher temperature oxides. So if we are not going to use a continuous low melting ceramic liquid like a low melting glass flux to achieve our, our continuous ceramic from our, our greenware. Uh, we will usually use uh, some, some pressure, some mechanical energy to assist, give us a little bit more energy to assist in getting rid of those surfaces and reducing our void space. And so this is typically used for a lot of our metal powder processing and our, our very high temperature oxide ceramics, our aluminas and, and silicon carbides and uh, those type of materials. So we will pour a powder. In this case, we'll usually not operate in the plastic phase at all. We'll just use a, a powder with a binder. It's poured into a mold. It's compacted by pressure, achieving a, a fairly a high level of compaction. So we'll start eliminating the voids uh, even before we start forming continuous bonds to that structure. We'll do that with uniaxial or multi-axis compression 
then we'll start to add heat quite often simultaneous with pressure and then start driving formation of a continuous ceramic or if we're using metal a continuous metal uh, throughout the material by just eliminating voids and surfaces. So since that might sound a little bit esoteric, here's a picture of how this happens um, on the powder level. So if we start over on the left, we have four, call it four ceramic particles. This is probably something like aluminum oxide. So we have a lot of surface area. If those are spheres, we have uh, four thirds pi r cubed uh, volume and we have uh, a, an r squared amount of surface area. And so that's a lot of energy. So um, the system is energetically going to want to get rid of that surface by forming one big sphere. If we give it a little help with a little bit of uh, pressure and then we increase the diffusion rate of that material by going to a very high temperature, we'll start to eliminate those surfaces. We'll form necks between the particles where they are now completely connected. So rather than having a free surface, we now have a grain boundary. And so when you get to the center, uh, the center figure B, you now have a continuous material that can hold load. So we now have a continuous uh, network of, of covalent oxide bonds that's now formed uh, a single part from four. Now unfortunately, because we got a great big pore in the middle, that's probably a great place for a crack to start. So our partially centered structure may be very strong, but if it's a ceramic uh, with that kind of big pore, it's probably very susceptible to fracture. It's got a big flaw already in it. So uh, given ceramics don't have a big K1C, we probably wouldn't want to use it that way. But all we have to do is put in a little more energy or maybe a lot more energy in the form of much more time at temperature and pressure. And eventually those voids are completely eradicated and we can reach a state of 100% density, complete elimination of those voids and formation of a multicrystalline monolithic material, which has a fairly good fracture toughness for a ceramic, definitely compared to a partially dense. But this is analogous to what would happen even in a hydroplastic uh, formed ceramic where we might have used water and a polymer binder and, and extruded uh, greenware use slip casting uh, eventually that greenware will be sintered uh, with a process like this or with a liquid ceramic flux uh, with a liquid phase sintering both are very similar and will give you a monolithic ceramic part Typical porcelain composition. So this is again different types of crystalline ceramics. We discussed alumina, silicon carbide, some of our, our very high temperature, high strength technical ceramics. Uh, if we go to the lower cost end, we can still get very good performance in many cases from mineral ceramics. So these are not synthesized oxides and carbides, but they're, they're mined products. And one of the most common ones that's used is uh, clay. So this is the, the clay mineral series, which consists of sheets, alternating sheets of uh, octahedral and tetrahedral silicates, and usually aluminas. Uh, these have great properties for processing in many cases because they absorb water uh, and they can allow for uh, a variety of uh, viscoelastic type of processes in the liquid state when we do add water. And so this just gives you an idea of the type of materials that we would use in those cases. Clays uh, for hydroplastic processing and eventually forming the body of the ceramic. We can add second phase particles, specific fillers uh, that would be discontinuous and would function like a, 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 part, a ceramic matrix composite. And then our fluxing agents are our low melting uh, amorphous uh, still ceramic phases that we would use for uh, for firing and liquid phase sintering. Mentioned clays and hydroplasticity. This is a little bit of a uh, crude schematic of a typical clay mineral. This is kaolinite and it shows the alternating layers of the silica tetrahedra and what's called gibbsite or uh, an, an octahedral alumina layer those are actually covalently bonded with the silicate tetrahedra uh, being opposing layers or 
a silica gibbsite a sheet opposing and being hooked together with just van der Waals bonds or with hydrogen bonds and interposed water molecules. So the more water that's added to this, the further apart those layers get and the more they'll flow. And so the, uh, the water content of clay minerals uh, has a huge effect on um, their yield strength. And this is, of course, in the particulate state, not the, not the fired state. Then it would be covalent bonding. Just really quick. So speaking of continuous uh, covalent bonding in a ceramic, uh, that bring, kind of brings us to the subject of cementation. In this case, we're talking about Portland cement. Again, this is, this is actually the active ingredient, if you would have it, of concrete, which is a ceramics matrix composite. So in this case, the matrix is a tricalcium silicate that is hydrated to form a 3D network of calcium silicate hydrate. So this is akin to a thermoset network polymer, except it's hydrated silicate bonds. It's hydrated silica tetrahedra uh, going in 3D. It is not surprisingly very brittle, but if it's kept in compression, works great. Uh, like I said, this is the basis for concrete. So our 3D network of calcium silicate hydrate is the cured Portland cement. Most frequently, concrete will involve that Portland cement with aggregate uh, that gives it more strength, gives it some crack-stopping capabilities. That will be sand or gravel. Uh, this has, again, of course, widespread use in civil infrastructure, but again, must be used exclusively in compression. If you're going to apply any kind of tensile or bending loads, you must put a, a secondary reinforcer in addition to your aggregate solely to carry the tensile loads. And classically, this is, of course, reinforcing bar steel or steel wire, although more recently uh, there's been some advances in using polymer fibers and even carbon fiber uh, as the tensile load carrying component in concretes. And there's quite a bit of, of success in that arena. Okay, last but not least are monolithic polymers. Again, we, we touched on polymer processing just a bit in reference to composites. If you've watched that lecture or read the, over those notes or that part of your textbook, but this is just focusing on monolithic polymers, how do we get them, and a, a few quick uh, classic forming techniques. So thinking back to mainly thermoplastic polymers, uh, how do we actually get those long chains? Uh, by now you're familiar with molecular weight and degree of polymerization. So we're going to step back and talk about how did we get there. So this is polymer synthesis. There's two main kinds, addition, also known as chain polymerization, and condensation, also known as step polymerization. So chain polymerization is, is pretty fast. It's used for simple uh, linear type of polymer molecules, mainly the vinyl, so polyethylene, PVC, polystyrene, polypropylene, etc. So we start out with initiation, just like it says. So in this case, we have a polyethylene monomer, and that's the C double bond C with four hydrogens. That is a polyethylene monomer. And we use a very chemically active uh, component, uh, usually a peroxide type molecule that has some electrons that are uh, pretty much ready to react and donate. And that's the R with the dot. So that stands for a radical, and the dot indicates that it has a lone pair or other type of very electronegative group on one side uh, that's ready to react with the electrons in the double bond of that monomer. And indeed it does. And what ends up happening is the charge distribution propagates. Uh, the double bond opens, the radical attaches and bonds on with a single bond, and that extra distribution of negative charge now ends up on the other side of what is now an active monomer, and it can go on to react with something else. So we can uh, go on and basically repeat the process with another monomer and just keep adding them on. Uh, eventually, unfortunately, for people who like really high molecular weights, this can't go on forever. And uh, so eventually you will get these active centers on long growing chains meeting up. And at that point they can either disproportionate 
and we can get transfer of, of a hydrogen and reestablishment of a double bond, which is shown in disproportionation for on the left-hand side of the lowest part of the schematic. Or we can just have the chains combine, and uh, that's shown on the right-hand side, where we now have radicals on both sides, but no, uh, but no free uh, electronegative group to initiate more reactions. So it's it's done. That's as as big as it's going to get. In the case of the uh, of disproportionation, where we still have a double bond that has the potential for reacting more if there was more initiator placed although the rate might not be as fast as it would be for a free monomer. So obviously, if we are going for really, really high molecular weights, uh, we want to do whatever we can to, uh, to inhibit that termination because, of course, that's the sooner these chains terminate, the lower the average molecular weight will have. And the world of polymer synthesis in large part revolves around finding ways to do that. Okay, second type of polymer synthesis, condensation. So it's called stepwise because we, we form things one step at a time instead of being able to, to literally form long chains very quickly the way we did uh, in the addition polymerization. So the most classic example of condensation polymerization is, is nylon, where we react a hydrogen from the amine group of hexamethylene diamine with a hydroxyl group of adipic acid those will combine to form water, which is, a, which is the condensate in condensation polymerization. It will go away. We'll probably evaporate it away or uh, sequester it away so it doesn't form back pressure on the chemical reaction and stop it. And then we'll have combined the hexamethylene diamine and adipic acid to form a single repeat unit of nylon 6,6. And then, of course, the hydroxyl ends and uh, the hydrogens on the amine end on both sides can go on to react with more. So it will then react uh, on both ends. So this is a, a bifunctional. So it's going to grow in both directions. And again, we need to keep getting rid of the water as this reaction progresses, or it will slow down the reaction rate and eventually stop it. Think of Le Chatelier's principle. Okay, once we have formed these nice long chains of thermoplastics, we want to process them into something. So, again, we discussed thermoplastic process, excuse me, thermoset processing a little bit in, in response to, or uh, in reference to reaction injection molding and other uh, types of reaction based processes. And now we'll speak just very, very briefly about the way we process thermoplastics. And this will have a lot in common with our metals processing and our silicate glass processing because in many cases it's, it's almost the same but lower temperature. So important things to remember about thermoplastics, they are not chemically cross-linked and so we can, uh, we can re-soften them and we can repeat many of these processes as many times as we want. Uh, that's the, basically the heart of recycling a thermoplastic manufactured items. Something to remember about recycling thermoplastics. Every time we re-soften and uh, we put that material through these processes again, it is damaged a little bit. There's a little bit of thermal oxidation damage, and so our average molecular weight is going to start creeping downwards. So uh, when you look at thermoplastic reprocessing, it's more downcycling than recycling. This is not the case for silica glasses and metals. When we melt those and recast them or reprocess them, uh, we don't get a decrease in properties or an, a fundamental alteration in the structure the way we do with thermoplastics and the reduction in average molecular weight. So just, uh, just a caution there. There's nothing free. On the flip side, thermoplastics can be reprocessed at much lower temperatures, so there's an energetic trade-off there. If we go with a thermoset, uh, again, full covalent network or certainly chemical covalent crosslinks uh, will degrade, burn, uh, not melt, and, uh, and we can't reprocess the same way we do thermoplastics. In fact, we can't reprocess at all. So the workhorse uh, technique for processing thermoplastics is extrusion. So in this case, uh, we take our synthesized polymer, our polyethylene, polypropylene, we form it into little pellets, uh, just like 
a kind of pea gravel or smaller, uh, dry it so that it flows freely, kind of like sand, and we feed it into a, screw, a heated screw with a nozzle on one end. So that turning screw conveys the pellets and compresses them and then uh, conveys them past portions that are, are heated usually with a resistance heater. So this isn't gas fired the way a metal would be. And so the combination of the shearing from the screw and the heaters uh, soften the material, melt it if we're talking about a, um, a crystalline polymer or just soften it well above TG, reduce the viscosity. And so we have uh, a low viscosity liquid or at least moderate viscosity liquid coming out uh, the other end of the extruder and this can be used to uh, to basically feed a continuous mill line to make tubing or rods or sheets or it can be used to fill a mold. So if we're going to fill a mold uh, quite often we will not just uh, meter the, the molten polymer in uh, from the end of the extruder, uh, we'll ram it in and put it in under some force which will of course give it the shear stress it needs to flow and fill a complex mold. So we'll use uh, a ram extruder which is basically like a normal extruder except it has an axially articulating uh, hydraulic ram. So we will melt and, and fill the front portion of the extruder with the ram retracted and then we get sufficient quantity of low viscosity molten polymer at the front of the at the at the front of the extruder the ram will move forward and force that into the mold under the appropriate amount of pressure so this should sound a lot like what we started with an hour ago or so with our uh, our die and permanent mold casting of metals this is very very analogous so last but not least is blown film extrusion and this is kind of kind of neat because we hook a, uh, a compressed air nozzle literally to the front of an extruder and blow air uh, through the center of an axis symmetric extrusion and stretch it and uh, with a big air bubble and we end up with a film of, of very precise gauge thickness and because we're not only pulling it upwards as uh, in, in order to contain it and, and send it on down the process, we're introducing a hoop stress with that air. So we can actually get what's uh, effectively uh, align chains in two directions. So we can get a film that's strong widthwise and lengthwise out of this. And that gives us a lot of advantages uh, if we're making parts that, that need strength in two directions. This is also useful if we need to form a preform for something that again requires strength in multi-directions like plastic bottles. So many, many possibilities. So that is it for processing. Uh, apologies for this being a, a very whirlwind tour. Uh, there is a tremendous amount that you can go into depth in any one of these processes and there are many, many, many more specific to each type of material and generally more coming uh, every day practically. One that we have not touched on beyond sintering and which is quite an extension of that is additive manufacturing where combinations of, of uh, polymer uh, thermosetting and uh, uh, excuse me, sintering of either metals or ceramics or polymers are used to build parts up additively. Uh, sometimes uh, photopolymerization is used in this and that's in a whole new field uh, that is emerging and really coming into its own as a competitor to uh, the more material wasting methods like machining which are subtractive definitely. So uh, again we didn't even touch on those other than to present the fundamental basis uh, that they depend on, uh, namely uh, thermosetting and sintering. But if you keep those processes in mind, the things that are necessary to get a good void free part in sintering, you will at least have the basis of going forward of how you would design say a, a sintering based additive manufacturing process. So these fundamentals will, uh, will apply across the board in that arena as well. So that is again it for the day and thank you for a good class.